I'm going to talk about pain nice almost beginning with zero. Okay, and apologies for not being able to speak German, but uh, please stop me if you have any questions. Okay, now if you look over here, there is a website listed, and on that website you will find a huge amount of information on everything that I'm going to talk about, including you can download a complete book free of charge on the Bayonet. Uh, pain and fields. Okay, so there's about 600 pages of information there if you want. Uh, the reason I'm going to talk about pain is, of course, you asked me to talk about it, but uh, in the last lecture, I will show you some material which might be of interest to you, which is uh, armor made from pain and fields. Okay, so these are the three crystal structures of iron. <coughs> uh, you can see here body-centered cubic iron, which we call uh, ferrite, uh, face-centered cubic iron, which we call austenite, and hexagonal closed-backed iron, which is um, epsilon. And epsilon iron occurs only at very high pressures, so we believe that it's there in the center of the Earth, for example, where the temperature is about 6,000 Kelvin and the pressure about 130,000 atmospheres. But it also happens in ballistic testing as a transient phase. Uh, when, when you have a very, very high strain rate, you can reach pressures which are extremely high. But the vast majority of uh, uh, steels consist of body-centered cubic iron or face-centered cubic iron. And this is the uh, phase diagram for pure iron, where we have uh, the ferrite stable at low temperatures and ambient pressure, and also at very high temperatures. So delta is nothing, is not different from alpha. It's basically body-centered cubic iron. But it then transforms into austenite as we cool the material, and transforms back into body-centered cubic iron. And epsilon happens at very, very high pressures. So just in pure iron, we have three different crystal structures. And actually, you can produce six different crystal structures, but they are usually only there in very thin films or small particles. Okay, we can have the tragonal iron, uh, triclinic iron, and so forth. And of course, uh, iron on its own, it can be very strong, but you can get many, many more properties if we add carbon. So steel is a mixture of iron and carbon. Here we have a carbon atom in an octahedral interstice in austenite and an octahedral interstice in ferrite. The difference between these two is that here the hole is a regular hole. That means it's a regular octahedron. All the sides of the octahedron are equal in length. So the presence of the carbon causes a volume change. And the volume change interacts very little with dislocations, so the strengthening caused by carbon in austenite is quite small. Here you can see that this octahedron is not regular. The distance in this uh, vertical direction is the lattice parameter, but the distance along the horizontal direction is root <coughs> 2 times the lattice parameter. So the strain is tetragonal. And a tetragonal strain has a very strong interaction with dislocations. So carbon in ferrite causes enormous hardening, far more than carbon <coughs> in austenite. And it's because the strain field here is not symmetrical. And this is the other common phase in steels, uh, a compound of iron and carbon, a uh, cementite. So that there are about 56 atoms inside the unit cell. It's a very hard and it can be a brittle phase. So sometimes you want to avoid it, and I'll show you how to avoid the cementite later on. And in terms of the iron carbon phase diagram, uh, this is what it looks like uh, in the binary case. So this is just pure iron and pure carbon mixed. Of course, there is no steel that we use which only has iron and carbon. Typically, there are something like 20 different solute additions inside the steel to control various properties. And I'll explain what they do. 
Now, given that just with iron and carbon we have all this complexity with many different phases, uh, you can control the structure by altering uh, the chemical composition, you can alter the temperature, the pressure, and so on. And if I add more alloying elements, then there's a very large number of possibilities. And I can summarize the different, the major phase transformations that happen in steels in the next slide. And bear in mind that that slide doesn't include hundreds of other phase transformations involving precipitation reactions, many different kinds of carbons. Okay? So these are the major phase transformations that happen uh, in steels. And I've divided them into two columns. These are transformations which require diffusion. So if we start with the parent crystal structure, which is austenite, and we break all the bonds, and then rearrange them into a different pattern, then that's called reconstruction. And that reconstruction requires diffusion uh, so that strain energy is minimized. Okay, so these transformations will happen at high temperatures, involving the formation of ferrite, massive ferrite, and perlite. The second major class of phase transformations uh, does not involve the breaking of bonds. It involves the deformation of the parent lattice into the product. <coughs> so there is no need to break bonds, there is no need for diffusion. So these are called displacive transformations, because if you change the pattern in which the atoms are arranged, by a deformation, then you will macroscopically see a change in shape. Okay, and I will show you that later on. Now, remember that that change in shape is happening inside your steel, so it will cause a lot of strain energy. So these are strain energy dominated transformations. There's Wiedmann ferrite, bainite, <coughs> and martensitic transformations. Most people are very familiar with martensite because it's a completely diffusionless transformation. Uh, it's it's simple in that sense. You know, there's no chemical composition change, and the crystallography is very well defined. And these are the transformations uh, which become difficult to interpret because they happen at temperatures where it's possible that there is some diffusion and some displacement. And I will, I will describe that shortly. So the basic uh, set of phase transformations represent the 1.4 billion tons of steel that we make every year. Okay, 1.4 billion tons. There's no other material produced in this quantity other than concrete. If you, if you look at titanium, there's about 60,000 tons produced every year. And aluminum will be approximately 70 million tons. And the only phase transformations that happen in aluminum are precipitation reactions. So, Steels are extremely important in every aspect of life. I don't need to tell you that, but it's important that people realize there is enormous potential. You can get material which is just 50 megapascals in strength to something that's five and a half gigapascals in strength, commercially produced. Okay. Not in the laboratory. In the laboratory, we can get to strength of 10 gigapascals, but you cannot produce that on a large scale. Okay, so um, the crystal structures we have, uh, the most important ones, are the body-centered cubic and the phase-centered cubic. This is the parent phase which we obtain by heating to a high temperature, approximately 1,000 degrees centigrade. And then depending on what we do from that temperature, the cooling rate, etc., uh, we will generate this structure in different ways. And the one that I'm going to focus on is displacive transformation. And just to illustrate what that means, imagine that we have this square pattern, and I want to change it into a different crystal structure. Then I can do that by a physical deformation. Okay. So there is no breaking of bonds here. But you can see that the shape has changed. And you should be able to see that change in shape when you look at the steel. So the next movie that I'm going to show you, you will actually see this kind of a shape change when the atoms change their pattern. Okay. So th this is a real movie 
of the shape change happening when bainite forms. So here you see the austenite grain structure. Okay, and we are observing this using con confocal light microscopy. And you've got the temperature here. As, as I cool the material, you will see uh, shape deformation due to the formation of bainite. So, here. But there's no etching involved here. These are displacements being produced on the surface of the steel when the bainite crystals form. So, when I say it's a displacement transformation, I mean that you actually get displacements which are very large and which you can physically observe. So, I explained there are two different ways in which the atoms move, and I can illustrate that schematically over here. So ima imagine that this is our parent material and the atoms are arranged in this particular pattern and we have two different kinds of atoms, the square atoms and the round atoms. I can alter this pattern by physical deformation and there's no breaking of bonds so the composition of this region is exactly the same as the composition of this region. And I can say that this particular atom in the product phase came from this atom in the parent phase. So there is a one-to-one -one atomic correspondence and therefore the product phase knows where the atoms came from in the parent phase. So if I reverse the transmission, I recover exactly the shape. And that is the shape memory effect that you might be familiar with. You, know, uh, you can, if you go forward and reverse through the phase transmission, then you recover the shape. Now, in the reconstructive transmission, you achieve the same pattern in which the atoms are arranged, but there is no macroscopic shape change because you can think of that as a transformation like this. You cut this triangle and you transport it onto this side. And that is the diffusion that's necessary to achieve the change in the crystal structure without a shape change. So there is very little strain energy associated with this transformation. And because we have diffusion, the chemical composition of this region is not identical to this, and you have lost the atomic correspondence. Now, the reason why I'm emphasizing the strain energy, you will see later, <coughs> it helps to reduce the grain size enormously in the case of displacement transformations. The strain energy is so large that the crystals form extremely fine in size. Now, all of these transformations will have a certain rate at which they form. And the only reason why we get displacive transformations is because the rate of diffusion is slow at low temperatures. They are not, kinet uh, they are not thermodynamically flavored because strain is you know, it's something that you anneal out. So reconstructive transformations will happen in a thermodynamic context favorably compared with displacive transformations. Displacive transformations are non-equilibrium transformations. So if I look at a different kind of a diagram, where I'm plotting the temperature and the time here, and I start with austenite at a high temperature and I rapidly cool it to this temperature and hold it, then I will get reconstructive transformation happening at this rate. Uh, in contrast, I have to undercool a lot more before I get displacive transmission, because it only happens if diffusion is limited. And in iron, diffusion becomes difficult at temperatures below about 600 degrees centigrade. So displacive transmissions happen roughly at temperatures below 600 degrees centigrade. One more thing I'd like you to notice is that here we are plotting time as a logarithmic scale. Okay. And if I add manganese to steel, then I retard both sets of transformations because manganese stabilizes the austenite relative to the ferrite. It reduces the free energy change in going from austenite to ferrite. But the change here is much, much bigger than the change here. And the reason is that in the case of reconstructive transformations, you not only influence the thermodynamic stability of the austenite, but also the manganese must diffuse during transmission, and that slows it down. Here, you only have the thermodynamic effect. So 
the influence of things like manganese, nickel, silicon, and so on that you add to steel on displacing transmissions is purely thermodynamic. They do not diffuse during transmission, so the retardation of the rate by adding things which stabilize austenite is much smaller. You know, this is a logarithmic scale, this is a much bigger change than here. So we need to treat displacive transmissions differently from reconstructive reactions. And I mentioned to you that ferrite and perlite both involve diffusion, therefore they happen at relatively high temperatures. But there are three phases in steel, all of which involve displacements. And this is Riefenstahl and ferrite, which I'm not going to talk about today. Uh, the Bainite reaction and martensitic transmission, and there are two forms of bainite which I will describe shortly. So upper bainite happens at relatively high temperatures and lower bainite at relatively low temperatures. Uh, and in designing steels, we need to think about all of these phase transmissions because you need to control them all. And that's why I think in your notes, I've given you a, a chapter that I wrote of all the phase transformations that happen in steel, not just the bainite reaction. You know, if you want to produce bainite, you have to control the ferrite and perlite. You have to avoid the martensitic transformation. If you want to produce perlite, then you've got to stop the displacive transformation from happening. So in our computer programs, you need to have all of these phases to design a steel, not simply looking at bainite or martensite, etc. Okay, going back to bainite, there are two forms of bainite that are uh, classically recognized, right? Uh, the first one is this upper bainite, and I've put some typical scales here. Uh, the plate is about a quarter of a micrometer in thickness and about 10 micrometers in length, typically. And remember that this is without any thermomechanical processing. It's purely by phase transmission. You're obtaining a grain size which is about a quarter of a micrometer in thickness. <coughs> the plates are thin, so the mean free slip distance through, through the plate is roughly twice the thickness. So the fact that it's 10 micrometers in this direction doesn't matter. The mean free slip distance is about 0.4 of a micrometer. So this is a, a, a really fine structure. And in between the plates of of bainite, you find cementite particles. And these are fairly coarse cementite particles in high strength steels, so they are not very good for toughness. In lower bainite, if you look in a transmission electron microscope, because you know this, this is uh, below the resolution of light. Light has a wavelength of uh, about half a micrometer. So when you look at bainite in an optical microscope, microscope, you do not actually see this structure. You just see a black object, which is the whole of this region. Okay. Uh, and certainly you cannot resolve these car white particles which are inside the bainitic ferrite plate in lower bainite. So here we get precipitation inside the plates as well as between the plates. And any theory that we have must explain why we get this change when we form bainite at upper uh, high temperatures and when we form bainite at low temperatures. Um, <coughs> one question. When you uh, design a structure for a rail steel, what do you take out of bainite? Yes. Uh, yes. So in my second lecture, mm. I will explain that okay. exactly. Because um, <coughs> I said to you that the cementite particles are not good for toughness. Mm -hmm. So if we want to make a rail steel, it's better to make the bainite without any cement. Yeah. And we can do that by adding certain elements, and I'll show you that exactly in the second part. Okay. Okay. Uh, I was using uh, rail steel from first IP for a ballistic test, but it behaved brittle. But, but then what happened? It behaved brittle. Okay, yeah. So exactly that point. So That's a very good point. And uh, I'll come back to that. Okay. Yeah? Uh, because, you know, the purpose of looking at microstructure and uh, thinking about thermodynamics and kinetics is to design steels. Yeah? And that's a very good question. So I'm glad I mentioned that the cementite is not good for toughness if you are looking at very strong steels. 
Right, so any theory has to be able to explain these changes in structure. If I show you what this looks like in a transmission electron micro uh, microscope, then this is upper bainite. You can see these very fine flakes of bainitic ferrite. Look at the sharp tips there. Are. That's a consequence of these flakes of transmission. I'll show you why they are sharp. And in between the flakes, we have the cementite. And this is lower bainite, where we have cementite in between the plates, but also cementite precipitated inside the plates of bainite. And the scale here is half a micrometer, so you cannot resolve this using optical microscopy. Uh, optical microscopy will make the whole of this cluster of plates look like a single plate. So if I show you an optical micrograph, this is a two surface micrograph, okay, so we are looking at uh, two polished surfaces together so that we can see the three-dimensional shape. So here you can see that the shape is a plate in three dimensions, and this is etching extremely dark. Uh, the scale here is 50 micrometers. So when you etch something, if there is internal structure, it will etch dark. So you can see that this is not uniformly dark, it's because there is fine structure in there, which we cannot resolve using the optical microscope. Uh, I'll show you transmission micrographs of this object later, and you'll see that there's incredible fine structure inside that. Now, the fact that this forms as a plate is important. Now, why, why is that important? Well, if you look at the shape change in detail, that means you start with austenite, and you transform it into bainite, then the shape consists of a shear and a dilatation which is normal to this plane, the plane of the plate. Okay? So this is what we call an invariant plane strain. That means it leaves this plane, this plane here, unchanged. The volume change is normal to the plate, and the shear is in this direction. So let me ask you a question. What is the typical value of an elastic strain? If I take a piece of steel and I pull it, uh, apply a stress of 200 megapascals, what is the typical elastic strain? 0.5%? Yeah, uh, so 10 to the minus 3. This shear here is 0 0.26. Huge. Okay. And, and this here is 0 0.03. So this deformation is very large. And remember that each crystal is surrounded by hundreds of other crystals. So it's pushing against everything. So there will be an enormous strain energy. And that strain energy per unit volume is given by the square of the strains. This is the shear modulus of the austenite, and this is the thickness over the length. And this equation is very simple to understand. If I, if I take stress and strain, and we are looking at elastic strain surrounding the plate, then we have a straight line. And the area under the curve is the strain energy. So it's a half sigma times epsilon. And if I replace sigma by the modulus times strain, then that's equivalent to half uh, epsilon squared times the modulus. So you can see here we have the strain squared and the modulus. We don't have the half because this is a plastic strain. It's not an elastic strain. So really we should be looking at the area here. Okay. This is a permanent strain. This part is much more difficult to derive. You have to use Ashelby theory. But let me explain to you why Reducing the aspect ratio, that means the thickness divided by length, reduces the strain energy. So if I draw that diagram again, uh, where I have my parent phase, and this is the product, then you can see that the displacement increases as I move away from this plane. The strain is the same, because the strain is the displacement divided by the height. 
But if you are pushing against your surroundings, then the thicker you make the plate, okay, the thicker you make the plate, the greater will be the displacement of pushing. Okay. So that is why the plate ends very sharp because basically the displacement goes towards zero even though the strain is the same and if you reduce the thickness of the plate then the strain energy is minimized so we have here an automatic mechanism which gives you extremely fine grains okay. and grain size refinement is the only mechanism which increases strength and toughness so this is automatic, there's no thermomechanical processing involved. Uh, and I showed you a movie of the displacements, but to actually do these measurements, you need much higher resolution. That was a, a confocal laser microscope, which, which is basically optical resolution. In order to characterize the deformation, you need atomic force microscopy. And this is a single crystal of austenite that is transformed into bainite and then you do atomic force microscopy which measures the surface topography and you can see that there are large displacements from which you can measure the shear strain to be about 0 0.26 I'd like you to notice one more thing here this is the austenite and the austenite itself has been deformed because this is a very large shape change. The shear is 0 0.26. And at high temperatures, the austenite doesn't have strength. So it relaxes by plastic deformation. Okay. And uh, schematically, if you look at martensite, you get a very neat shape change. Because you're transforming at a low temperature where the austenite is strong and it can sustain the elastic strains. But with bainite, you get plastic deformation in the adjacent austenite. And that actually is really important. You can see it in the atomic force microscope image here. Uh, you can see the curvature next to the plate of the austenite. And if I do transmission electron microscopy of the interface between the bainite and the austenite, I will see enormous dislocation angles. So this is the austenite and this is the bainite ferrite. You can see huge dislocation density created at the interface. Now, why is this important? A displacive transformation is like slip. If you put obstacles in the way of slip, then it cannot progress, right? You know, you basically work hard in the material. So, if you put precipitates, etc., in the way of slip, then the slip is stopped. Similarly, these dislocations, which are generated by the plate itself, will stop the plate from growing. So, essentially, the interface between the bainite and austenite consists of dislocation. If I put obstacles in the way of those dislocations, then that interface will stop moving. These dislocations are glissade, that means that they can glide without diffusion. But if I put obstacles in the way, then they will not be able to move. So the plate generates the defects and then kills itself. It cannot grow anymore. So this is another mechanism of grain refinement inside material. If I deform the austenite plastically before transformation, that will also stop the bainite reaction. So here is an experiment in which we take a, a <coughs> cylinder of steel and we compress it. So because of barreling, that means that, you know, the sample is constrained at the grips, but then it grows in the shape of a barrel. You get strain gradients inside here, and you can work out what the strain gradients are. Here you have the largest strain, here you have the smallest strain. If you look at this region, you do not get bainite. So this is a, a, a micrograph showing you in this region you have very little bainite, in this region you have a lot of bainite. So if you put plastic strain in the austenite, that retards the bainite transformation. So this is a, called mechanical stabilization. 
and it works for all displacive transformations. You can retard martensite by putting dislocations in the parent phase or by putting precipitates in the parent phase. You can retard weakness and ferrite by doing that as well. And it's, it's a very good method of distinguishing displacive and reconstructive transformations. Because in reconstructive transformations, if you deform the austenite, you actually accelerate the transformation because when the ferrite grows, it absorbs, the, uh, it destroys the dislocation. So there's a gain in free energy, exactly like recrystallization. Yeah, so in a displacive transformation, this interface is glissade. That means the structure of the interface allows the dislocation to move without diffusion. And mechanical stabilization never occurs with reconstructive transmission. So you don't need transmission electron microscopy or anything fancy. If you retard the transformation by deforming the parent phase, then it's a displacive transmission. Okay. This is an absolute proof. Okay. So we have these um, um, dislocation tangles. And what is the consequence of those dislocation tangles which are generated as the plate grows? Well, again here we have an optical micrograph. And look at the scale here. It's 50 micrometers. So we are not looking here at individual plates. But if I take this plate and I look at it in a transmission electron microscope, you get extraordinary detail inside this region. Okay? So here is a montage of transmission electron micrographs of one of these plates. And you can see that it consists of thousands of small plates. In an optical microscope, so this is one micrometer scale. Optical microscope, this looks like a single plate, but actually it's thousands of small plates. And this is the beginning here, and this is the end. And you can see that the size of the plate is the same here and here. That means that the plate grows to a certain size, stops growing, and then you have to nucleate another one, and another one, another one, to form this macroscopic sheaf. That means a collection. You know, when you have wheat, and you tie it up, that's called a sheaf of wheat, a bundle of wheat. This is a <coughs> bundle of very fine plates. If this was martensite, this would be a single coarse plate. Okay, because uh, the austenite does not relax at low temperatures. So the structure of bainite is actually finer than the structure of martensite in the same steel because of this plastic relaxation. You, you actually refine the size by a factor of about a thousand. And it's an automatic method of refinement which is only present there with the bainite reaction. Now, I described to you the structure of bainite. And I said, look, um, there are carbides. And I said to you that the displacive transmission doesn't involve diffusion. So that doesn't make sense, right? You know, to precipitate cementite, you must have diffusion. And yet, when we look at the shape change and so on, you've got displacement. So what's happening? But well, supposing that we look at the interface between bainite and austenite using an atom probe. An atom probe is an instrument where you can see individual atoms and you can identify what those atoms are. So here is uh, an image that I took in 1981. Now there are much, much more powerful instruments where you can get a three-dimensional structure. Uh, here we have the interface between the austenite and the bainitic ferrite, and these are ion atoms. Uh, sorry, these are ion atoms. Uh, so there's also a time of flight mass spectrometer, so you can distinguish different kinds of atoms. Silicon atoms are uniformly distributed. You can you can do a lot of analysis on the data that you get. You collect more than a million atoms. And you can show that the substitutional atoms do not move at all during transformation. Okay? There's no segregation to the interface and absolutely no movement of the substitutional atoms. But look what's happened to the carbon. Okay? 
And you see that there's a lot more carbon in the austenite than in the ferrite. So if you look at this image, you would conclude that it's a displacive transformation, but carbon atoms are small atoms. They are in the holes inside the crystals, and they can move during transformation. Okay. Now, we need to ask whether that is correct, because carbon can move very rapidly, you know, in a fraction of a second. So what we are looking at may actually have happened after the reaction, you know, almost like tampering of molecules. So we need to think a little bit more. Now let's assume that it is truly diffusion length. There is no movement even of carbon. Okay. Uh, and I'll, I'll explain to you, the alternative is that the carbon moves during transformation. We need to distinguish to those two cases. But let's assume for one moment that the carbon actually diffuses after transformation. So it's like producing bainite and then tempering it, but in a very short time. So if we assume that model, that bainite forms exactly like martensite, fully supersaturated with carbon, then at high temperatures, the carbon would escape into the surrounding austenite by a, a tempering reaction while you're transforming, and then precipitate as coarse cementite. At relatively low temperatures, you also have an opportunity to precipitate inside the plate because the diffusion becomes slower. And therefore, you get finer uh, cementite here and precipitation inside. So this is again like tempering of martensite. So this is consistent with a diffusionless transformation. And I'll go into this in a little bit more detail. So this would naturally explain the transition from upper to lower bainite. If I calculate the time taken for the carbon to escape here, then it's very, very short. Yeah, this is one second. And you know, as you go up in temperature, it's even less. Now, there's no experiment that we can do where we can stop the reaction in a fraction of a second and then put it into an instrument and look at the carbon. So it looks like it's impossible to determine whether the carbon diffuses during transformation or after transformation. But there is one, one method. Now, here I'm plotting the free energy of ferrite and of austenite at a particular temperature as a function of the carbon concentration. Okay. And normally when we calculate a phase diagram, we draw a tangent which is common to these two curves, and this gives me the equilibrium composition of ferrite and the equilibrium composition of the austenite. And if I do this as a function of temperature, then I get my phase boundaries, which were in the iron carbon phase diagram. Those two phase boundaries are this one here and this one, where this gives the equilibrium composition of the ferrite and the equilibrium composition of the austenite. Okay, so these are the two phase boundaries that we are all familiar with and you'll find on all iron carbon phase diagrams. And the data for calculating these curves are, are widely available. All right? So you can download a computer program from my website and calculate these phase boundaries very easily as a function of many different alloying elements. But that's the equilibrium phase diagram. What you won't find on the equilibrium phase diagram is this line, which we call the T0 line. And the T0 line represents the locus of points where austenite and ferrite of the same chemical composition have identical free energy. If I have austenite of this composition, I cannot transform it to ferrite of the same composition because that would lead to an increase in free energy. On this side, I can transform the austenite into ferrite of the same composition with a reduction in free energy. So diffusion-less transformation is impossible if the austenite has carbon concentration greater than T0. In principle, it's possible 
if the osmite has carbon less than T0. Is everyone happy with that? Okay. I will use this to design the rays theory. So you need to ask me a question if you don't understand this, okay? So the T0 line basically defines whether or not diffusion-less transformation is possible. Right, so uh, here is the same diagram. This is the T0 line and this is the equilibrium line. And I have a steel of composition, uh, a carbon content X bar. Right? If I <coughs> cool it to this temperature and allow bainite to form without diffusion, right? so I form a plate effectively of martensite, but then the carbon escapes from the plate. So the austenite becomes richer in carbon concentration. So the next plate forms from enriched austenite. This process can only continue until the composition of the austenite reaches the T0 line. Okay. So if this is diffusionless, the reaction will stop when the T0 line is hit. But if diffusion happens during transformation, then it will continue until this line. So by looking at the composition of the austenite at the point where the bainite reaction stops, you could decide whether it's diffusion-less or whether diffusion of carbon happens during transformation. And of course, if I lower the temperature, I will get more, more bainite. But you would still stop at this T0 line. So when you do that experiment, uh, of course, um, the reason why I'm using this dash over here is that in the calculations we must take account of the strain energy as well. You know, it's not an equilibrium transformation, so we have to modify the free energy curves to include the strain energy. And that's straightforward to do. Okay, so here are some measurements. And you can see the difference between the equilibrium line and the T0 or T0 dash line is very large and that the reaction actually stops at the T0 <coughs> line. So we can conclude from this that the transformation is diffusionless, completely diffusionless. Even carbon is not moving. But because it's happening at a high temperature, the carbon can escape and precipitate and cementize within the plates or between the plates. And we make the prediction from this that you know, the rate of reaction, uh, the growth rate of the bainite plate must be much faster than carbon diffusion allows. Okay. And we, we can measure those rate, growth rates. And as I go up in temperature, I will get a lot less bainite until I reach the T0 temperature, and then there will be zero bainite. Even though ferrite and perlite can form, you will not be able to form bainite above the T0 temperature, okay, which is much less than the equilibrium temperature. So as I raise the temperature, the transformation becomes zero volume fraction at the bainite start temperature. And the bainite start temperature is much less than the equilibrium temperature. Okay. So this is the only theory which will predict that the amount of bainite you get will become zero at a temperature of about 500 degrees centigrade. Of course, it depends on the steel composition, uh, but you can still get ferrite and perlite, but you will not get bainite above the T0 temperature. Okay, so to summarize, the growth process is diffusionless, and strain energy must be accounted for. It's quite a large term. So a typical... Um, free energy change for the formation of ferrite is about 40 joules per mole. The strain energy of bainite is 400 joules per mole. So you have to take account of that term. Okay. Uh, let's uh, let's uh, admit that is correct. And I said to you, we make some predictions. And the first prediction is that the growth rate of an individual plate must be much faster than carbon diffusion. So uh, I'm going to show you a sequence of images taken at one second intervals in a photo emission electron microscope. So remember that the scale of a bainite plate is very fine, you know, less than optical resolution. 
And it's no good measuring the growth rate of a collection of a plate, because that also involves the nucleation of new plates. So measurements which are reported on the basis of uh, confocal laser optical microscopy or hot state optical microscopy simply don't give you the growth rate of an individual plate. Right. This is an instrument uh, which uh, is from Neustadt University in Switzerland, where you have uh, an optical specimen which is inside an electron microscope and the electrons are emitted from the surface by shining UV light onto the specimen and you use those electrons to form an image. So the resolution is like that of a transmission electron microarray. And you see some plates growing from here. Uh, can you see these plates? Okay. And these are the additional plates nucleated. So we can resolve individual platelets and we measure the growth rate it's three orders of magnitude greater than carbon diffusion. So that's consistent. Now, we have uh, quantitatively modeled this process uh, of partitioning of carbon and uh, the formation of semen types. And we can predict the transition from upper bainite to lower bainite. When we did the work, uh, we did not believe this calculation for a long time because what this actually says is that in low carbon steels, I go from perlite to upper bainite to martensite. There is no lower bainite. Okay, so these are calculations. In high carbon steels, I go from perlite to lower bainite to martensite. There is no upper bainite. Whereas every single textbook, including my own in those days, said that you get perlite, upper bainite, lower bainite, and then myosite. What this is saying is that you do not get lower bainite in low carbon steels, and you do not get upper bainite in high carbon steels. And there is a narrow region here where you go from perlite to upper bainite to lower bainite, and then myosite. So we didn't publish this for a while, until we found evidence in the literature. So this is work by Oka and Okamoto for high carbon steels. And you can see you go directly from perlite to lower bainite to martensite. Okay? And the reason is that there is so much carbon there that you will precipitate inside the plate. Yeah. If you have more carbon in the steel, it takes longer for it to escape from the plate, so there's an opportunity to precipitate inside the plate. And if you look at Omori and Hancock's work for the low carbon region, you go from perlite to upper bainite to martensite because there is so little carbon that you can escape before precipitation can happen inside the plate. So, the model explains many, many things about the structure of Vena. And the mechanical stabilization that I talked about, that if you deform the austenite, then the reaction is retarded. That also can be dealt with quantitatively, because we know that the structure consists of Glissal dislocations and <coughs> the interface is driven by the free energy difference between austenite and ferrite. So the stress which moves those dislocations comes from the undercooling of the austenite. Okay. So the shear stress comes from the fact that we have a free energy difference between the austenite and the ferrite and that, uh, uh, that drives the interface. So the shear stress driving the interface is equal to the free energy change. And the resistance to the movement of the interface is provided by the dislocations that are generated in the austenite because of the relaxation of the shape chain. So all we have to do is take the resistance of the dislocation and solid solution hardening and equate it to the chemical driving force moving the interface and we have a theory for mechanical stabilization which predicts these observations that I explained, that here, where the strain is the largest in the austenite, we do not get bainite, here we get a lot of bainite. Okay. So, in the case of the bainite reaction, thermomechanical processing of austenite will actually stop 
the vein and transmission, but we don't need thermomechanical processing because the size is refined by the fact that it's a displacive transmission and refined further by the fact that the austenite relaxes and therefore generates dislocations and stops the blade from growing as coarse as martensite. So that is the basic mechanism of the Bainite transformation. And the reason why we need to understand that mechanism is to design steel. Okay. So the second part now is about the design of the steel using only the material that you have learned today. Okay. So you should be able to use this information to design steel. So do you have any questions before I go to the next presentation? One question. Yeah. How is the formation of self-tempered martensite different yeah. from the formation of um, lower banner? So uh, it is not uh, it is not different except in time scales okay. and the relaxation process. Okay. So the martensite plates are generally coarser than bainite because they form at a relatively low temperature and therefore the amount of relaxation you get is smaller. And uh, also the rate of the reaction is larger because the relaxation of the austenite, even though the place grow three orders of magnitude greater than carbon diffusion, martensite grows even faster because there isn't that relaxation. So anything that work hardens the austenite will make the place grow slower. Okay. If you don't have that work hardening, martensite will grow rapidly, so you transform a large region. Whereas in bainite, it's a, it's a steady process where you nucleate new nucleus. Okay. If you remove carbon completely, there is no difference between bainite and martensite. And how does this explain the alignment of the cement pipe within the layer? Oh, so you've got this carbon escaping from yeah. the plate and then it precipitates on the sides of the plate. But in, in the upper plane, so we have only under 60 degrees the cement type particles within the layer. Oh, in the in the yeah. low bainite. Yeah. yeah, and in, in the mountain side you have those. Yes, yes. In, in yes. Yeah. So that's a very good question. So the question is as follows: that um, in the low bainite plate, the cement type precipitates like this, whereas if you temper mountain side, you know you get. Uh, Wiedemann-Sutton array of cement types. So why is that? Yeah. So the cement type that forms during the tempering of martensite itself doesn't involve the diffusion of substitutional atoms. Yeah. So if you do an atom probe experiment, you find there is no partitioning of substitutional elements. Uh, therefore, it's influenced by the stress. So there is a lot of elastic strain around each one of these plates. If the driving force for precipitation is small, then only those cementite particles which comply with the strain are favored. But if the driving force is large, if I make low bainite in a very high carbon, you will get this. Yeah. Okay.